Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, my name is Marina Bretti. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm a clinician, a scientist with a special um, passion and uh, specialize in the treatment of patients with liver cancer, both the primary liver cancer, also known as hepatocellular carcinoma, and bile duct cancer, also known as cholangiocarcinoma. And today uh, I'm gonna discuss with you, um, an I'm gonna give you an overview on the way that we treat and manage uh, patients with primary liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. And I will be joined by Dr. Lafaro, which uh, she will discuss a little more the treatment of bile duct cancer. Um, I do wanna, of course, start by saying that this wants to be an overview. Of course, the treatment and management is much more challenging. My, much more nuanced, but we hope that we can provide you with a summary and an overview that hopefully can provide some guidance for everyone that is going through this journey, either themselves or their loved ones. And I wanna start by some of the epidemiology of hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC. This is a really uh, huge uh, global health problem. If we look at the world, uh, this is the sixth most common cancer and is the third leading cause of cancer-related mortality. And if we look more in data for the United States, unfortunately, the incidence and the trend are totally in line with what we see in the rest of the world. And unfortunately, over the last few years, this has been one of the fastest cause of cancer-related death in the United States and is prospected to become the third leading cause of cancer-related death by 2030. So this is a truly significant health problem that we need to tackle with in any way possible. And what are the risk factors? So up to 90% of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer have some form of underlying liver disease. And really cirrhosis, which is this chronic inflammation that leads to a sort of scar of the liver cancer, at the end of the day, is really the main risk factor for developing hepatocellular carcinoma. As cirrhosis can be um, caused by many different factors from virus infections such as hepatitis B or hepatitis C, but it can also be related to exposure to toxins such as alcohol. And more and more we see patients with a so-called fatty liver disease, which is more common in patients who have other comorbidities such as type 2 uh, diabetes mellitus and um, obesity. There is also um, a, a number of genetic predisposition, patients that are born with genetic um, abnormalities, but those are less uh, common, at least in our uh, population. And I do want to spend a couple of minutes about the hepatitis infection. As we know, here in the Western country, we have hepatitis B vaccination program, and those have really, really helped in strongly, significantly reduce the incidence of hepatitis B-related cirrhosis and cancer. But unfortunately, those vaccination programs are not implemented universally. So there are some patients' population that have still risk of contracting hepatitis B and developing, you know, unfortunately, hepatocellular carcinoma. And then when it comes to hepatitis C virus, we do not have vaccinations but we do have a very effective treatment. And this uh, treatment, antivirus treatment, can really debel and can eliminate the virus. And in doing so, reducing significantly the risk of uh, developing hepatocellular carcinoma. But there are two caveats that is always important. And this is something that I always discuss with my patients. So one caveat is that often we are not tested for hepatitis C routinely. So someone might have the infection without knowing. And second is that if the hepatitis C infection has induced cirrhosis in the liver, regardless of the fact that the hepatitis C virus has been successfully treated, those patients will still remain at higher risk of developing uh, liver cancers. So what we should do for these patients in which we identify risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma. 
So these patients will need to be followed very closely through surveillance program. And the decision to handle the surveillance program, of course, needs to be done with your primary care and even more with a liver specialist doctor, such as an hepatologist. And it depends on what is the risk of developing over time hepatocellular carcinoma based on the risk factors that I just um, summarized with you. And of course, we need also to take into consideration the age and the overall health, perhaps other uh, comorbidities. But if someone is um, uh, identified as a risk for hepatocellular carcinoma, should undergo this surveillance program, they really um, are through the implementation of abdominal ultrasound, and we can also obtain blood work, including the tumor marker called alpha fetoprotein that is very specific for these tumor types. And so patients that are at risk, with, mostly with cirrhosis, they go through this surveillance program and ultra. If we do identify a suspicious lesion, which usually needs to be at least one centimeter, those patients will need further evaluation, which usually um, requires either a specific type of CT scan or a specific type of MRI scan of the liver. And I'm not gonna go through these details, but a good radiologist can follow these very objective guidelines that can help to identify the lesions and try to understand what is the likelihood that the lesion can be either benign or really a malignant lesions. And there are some characteristic radiologically that are enough to make a diagnosis of primary liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. But very often the characteristic on imaging are not conclusive. And so what I want you really to take away from this is that the evaluation of these lesions, of this scan, of all these patients should really require a specialized expert, a multidisciplinary team, so that we can then develop a diagnostic approach that is really tailored for the specific situation of that patient. So now I wanna really give a brief overview of what are the main staging and treatment modalities for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, of course, we are talking of adult patients and population. So as I mentioned, uh, liver cancer hepatocellular carcinoma is a very peculiar type of cancer because arise in the setting of some underlying liver disease. So the staging system that we use is called the Barcelona um, Clinic Liver Action, also known as BCLC. And really here in this staging, we take into consideration not only the tumor staging, but also what is the underlying liver function and what is the overall performance and health status of the patient. And taking into consideration all these important factors, we can identify different stage. And you can see here, there are then the tailored you know, recommendation in terms of treatments. But you can also see that the treatment will span very greatly from local treatment to systemic treatment, really, again, emphasizing the idea that one size does not fit all and that each patient needs to be carefully evaluated in an interdisciplinary way. So early stage in this setting is defined as either a single um, lesion in the liver, or if you have up to three lesions that are all less than three centimeters. And the treatment recommendation can be very different. In some specific case, we may recommend a specific form of radiation called ablation. Sometimes surgery is the most appropriate treatment. Sometimes this patient will need a liver transplant. Really, the decision is based on many factors. We take into consideration not just the tumor characteristic, but also the liver function, the technical resectability, and the performance status of the patients. Again, I'm sorry, I'm going to be repetitive, but you can see a multidisciplinary evaluation is important. You have an expert, a pathologist, liver transplant um, a surgeon, uh, liver surgeons, medical oncologists, interventional radiologists, that they can all discuss what is the best treatment that can achieve the most curative um, um, eff eff effectiveness. And then 
The second stage is the so-called intermediate stage. In this case, we do have cancer that is still confined into the liver, but we have either multiple lesions throughout the lesions that are more than three centimeters. And again, here the treatment might be local regional with the delivery of chemotherapy directly to the bed of the cancer, the so-called um, chemoembolization or taste or radiation to the bed of the tumor, so-called the Y90 or radioembolization. In some patients, we do recommend to start with systemic therapy. Some patients might still be a candidate for a transplant. So, so this is a very extremely heterogeneous patient's population where a continuous re-evaluation within an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team is really key because once um, again, we want to always make sure that you are um, recommending the best treatment that can prolong the survival of the patients while still preserving the underlying liver function. And so again, I would just want to make sure make sure that we remember the importance of a multidisciplinary management. And now let's talk about the advanced stage. For advanced stage, we um, refer to those patients in which unfortunately the cancer has already spread either within the portal vein or um, uh, outside of the liver. In this case, the main recommendation is really um, systemic treatment. But really, over the past few years, we have made unprecedented progress in the treatment of liver cancer. So this is the current landscape. So you can see that between 2007, 2017, we only had one drug approved called sorafenib. But over the past five years, we have had the approval of many, many drugs. Some are target therapy, some are immunotherapy, there is also combination of the two. So really unprecedented progress that make very, very exciting time for um, patients um, and to give patients much, much more effective and also well-tolerated treatment. And I think really cancer immunotherapy has been the biggest revolution uh, for the treatment of many cancer types, including hepatocellular carcinoma. So in a nutshell, our immune system role is to recognize the self from non-self, but also to try to avoid to attack the self, so the so-called autoimmunity. To do so, there are special protein expressed on the immune cells called the checkpoint that can be turned on or turned off so that the immune response can happen. What happens is that the cancer cells use this checkpoint to hide themselves from the immune system. So we have now these drugs called the checkpoint inhibitors that are on the opposite helps the patient's own immune system to find the cancer cells and to kill the cancer cells. And also we have shown from you know, preclinical studies that if you combine these cancer cells with these checkpoint inhibitors and drugs, with drugs that actually um, work on the blood supply, try to starve the tumor, the formation and the growing of new blood vessels, the combination of the two can be more effective. And so this really was the um, reasoning behind also the approval, sorry, but um, the approval of this combination called atezolizumab and so immunotherapy plus the uh, drug that attack the blood vessel anti-VEGF. The combination was approved based on a big study called, uh, called Imbre 150. And in these studies, patients treated with this combination lived longer. They also lived longer without their cancer getting worse. It's a relatively well-tolerated drug, but because you're also going to act on the blood supply, on the blood vessels, one important requirement is that all patients before starting treatment have an endoscopy to assess for potential abnormal vessels and vein in the esophagus called the varices. And then we have another approach that is also now available for our patients, which is the combination of two checkpoint inhibition. Again, with a goal to really activate the immune system at different points in the body to really achieve the best anti-cancer um, immunity. And this combination that is now approved is called uh, STRIDE, 
and this is the combination of tremolimumab plus durvalumab, again approved based on a big study in which this combination meaningfully improved the survival of patients as compared to what was until then the only drug available, the, um, the one that I mentioned, sorafenib. And the safety data also show that there is no increased liver toxicity and there is no really increased bleeding risk with this combination. So I'm not going to go through all the drugs that we have available. I think that the take-home message is that we have um, many, many options and treatment options for our patients for hepatocellular carcinoma. The treatment paradigm is evolving, and the complexity is also of treating patients with some underlying liver disease. So really the goal is to have an expert team of people taking care of you so that we can think and tailor and sequence the therapy um, to achieve the best outcome from the cancer perspective, but also preserving the underlying liver function. And when it comes to Hopkins, that's why the cornerstone of the care of these patients is really a multidisciplinary care. We have multidisciplinary meetings followed by multidisciplinary um, clinics where the patient comes and see all the experts and the specialists at once. And really the overall goal is to deliver a comprehensive interdisciplinary care that is patient-centered and can improve our patient's journey through this collaboration, but also by streamlining, uh, streamlining of diagnostic and treatments. Um, and we this is our clinic. And um, with that, I'm going to I give the, um, um, I'm going to have Dr. Lafaro present herself and she will give us an overview on the management of patients with bile duct cancer. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Beretti. I am uh, going to be talking about, one second, let me just get my slides shared here. I'm going to be talking about a different form of liver cancer, one called cholangiocarcinoma. My name is Dr. Kelly LaFaro. I'm one of the surgical oncologists here at Johns Hopkins, and I focus exclusively on hepatobiliary cancers. So cholangiocarcinoma actually encompasses uh, three different uh, tumors. Now, these tumors are named based on where they arise in the biliary tract. So there's intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which arises in the bile ducts of the liver itself. There's what we call a clat skin tumor, which is also named hyler cholangiocarcinoma or perihyler cholangiocarcinoma, which arises between the bifurcation of the right and left main bile ducts. And there's also extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which arises in the common bile duct lower down and can also arise in what we call the intrapancreatic bile duct. Cholangiocarcinomas, just like hepatocellular carcinoma, are actually increasing all across the world. They're encompassed now about 15% of all primary liver cancers and about 3% of all GI malignancies. And you can see here, these are the incidences recently, um, but they have been increasing. You know, what can put you at risk for a cholangiocarcinoma? A lot of people ask. So risk factors for cholangiocarcinoma, some of them are similar to hepatocellular cancer. Um, those include hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection, which are similar between the two. There are also other risk factors that are not necessarily um, risk factors shared between both hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma, and those include some parasitic infections, as well as some toxins, uh, including aflatoxin, which is not a common toxin, but it is found in some agricultural uh, processes. Primary sclerosing cholangitis, which can be found in patients who have ulcerative colitis. Also, diabetes, obesity, alcohol intake, and smoking all increase risk of cholangiocarcinoma. And we think that the rise in incidence of cholangiocarcinoma is linked to in increase in obesity, as well as type 2 diabetes and non-alcohol liver disease uh, increase in the United States. So diagnosis. Um, so intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, or those who arise in the bile ducts of the liver itself, 
are often found actually incidentally when there's a CT scan or MRI done for another cause. Most patients are asymptomatic when the disease is found in the early stage, and your physician may order an MRI to provide enhanced assessment of the mass in the liver. They may also order a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, which has IV contrast, which allows us to show uh, any vascular enhancement um, and allow us to see whether or not that mass may be resectable. It can be difficult sometimes to determine between a hepatocellular carcinoma and a cholangiocarcinoma, so your physician may uh, recommend a biopsy if there's any question there. There's also a tumor marker that we use, and that allows us to tell it, basically we use it as a surrogate. It can be used in diagnosis uh, to suggest a cholangiocarcinoma over a hepatocellular carcinoma, and we look at the level of the CA199 and we use it as a surrogate for the amount of disease. If the CA199 is very high, it may indicate that there's some micrometastatic disease that we just cannot see on CT scan, and it may play a role in the recommendation for treatment. For perihilar and distal cholangiocarcinomas, the workup is pretty similar. Often patients, though, present with something called painless jaundice, or yellowing of the eyes or the skin uh, or tea colored urine. Uh, and this may have you go to your physician who might order labs and that may have an elevated bilirubin. If that happens, they will likely get something called an MRCP or MRI, which allows us to look at the bile ducts very closely. If there's anything seen on the MRCP and MRI, your physician may also recommend an endoscopic ultrasound or an ERCP where they put a camera in endoscopically and are able to look at the inside of the bile duct and take biopsies and place a stent if needed. They may also get a CT scan with IV contrast, which will allow us again to look in, at the blood vessels to see whether the tumor has any involvement. We're going to talk now about the management of cholangiocarcinoma. As with hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma is very important to be seen in a multidisciplinary clinic. It allows a comprehensive plan to be divided, devised, uh, options for clinical trials. It will provide assistance for the challenges that come along with a cancer diagnosis. It's obviously very anxiety-provoking, takes a lot of time and effort um, while you're going through treatment then we have resources that can help with that. You also are able to meet specialists from all the different areas, including medical oncology, surgery, transplant, interventional radiology, and radiation oncology. So when we look at patients who have cholangiocarcinoma, when they come to see us in clinic, they ha we have an algorithm that we use. Uh, we, you know, we look at everything, including the imaging and the tumor markers, uh, and we come up with a plan. So for patients who are uh, resectable when there's no vascular involvement, surgery remains the only chance at a poten potential curative treatment. Now that surgery uh, has a risk of recurrence, uh, most commonly in the first two years. And it's really important that your surgeon at the time does uh, adequate lymphadenectomy so they can stage the, any lymph nodes that are involved in the cancer. So depending on where the cholangiocarcinoma is, whether it's intrahepatic, you may need a hep what just a hepatectomy with a lymph node dissection where a portion of the liver is removed. Uh, it may require a hepatectomy with bile duct resection and lymph node excision uh, if it's lower down or at the bifurcation of the right and left duct. It may also even require a Whipple procedure if it's an extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and this is removal of the head of the pancreas, the bile duct, and the duodenum, and that's if the cholangiocarcinoma is lower down in the bile duct. And depending on where you get your treatment and the location of the tumor, these surgeries can be performed either open or minimally invasive. For patients who are not resectable up front, whether there's vascular involvement or not enough liver uh, that will be left after surgery, there are many new options available. And we'll go through them kind of one by one. There's 
options include chemotherapy or targeted therapies, local regional therapies, which would be where there's treatment of the tumor itself. It's not curative, but it can uh, help. These include ablation and hepatic artery infusion pump. And then another option is liver transplant. So we're gonna go through these now a little bit one by one. Systemic and targeted options. So uh, originally um, we really had very limited treatment for cholangiocarcinoma. There was only really one you know, chemotherapy option and it didn't work very well. And I'll show you a little bit, but there's been a lot of research done in cholangiocarcinoma. And here is just a list, and I'm not gonna go through them one by one, but of all the different um, molecular abnormalities that the tumor cells have that we now have targeted therapies for. And it really allows us to uh, have additional options for our patients. And you can see here up to 70% of biliary tract cancers have what we call an actionable alteration or one that there's a targeted therapy, at least under a clinical trial that's available. And that has been, is really an amazing uh, improvement for our patients. And here, just like hepatocellular carcinoma, over the last 10 years, you can see up until about 2017, we really only had gemcitabine and cisplatin systemic chemotherapy available. Starting in 2017 has led to the approval of multiple new agents and targeted therapy as well as immunotherapy that have really helped our patients. Some of the local therapies that are available include hepatic artery infusion pump. And the idea behind this, it's, it's similar to a port that's placed for systemic chemotherapy, although it's larger, about the size of a hockey puck. And it's placed under the skin on the left side of the abdomen. There's a tube that goes from the pump itself into the what we call gastroduodenal artery. And that delivers chemotherapy directly to the hepatic artery. And we know with these tumors that they're really fed by blood from the hepatic artery. It allows us to give chemotherapy uh, directly there. The chemotherapy we use in it is uh, constantly released um, a small amount all over the course of 24 hours, you know, throughout constantly. And it is uh, infused every two weeks. The goal is for the hepatic artery infusion pump for this chemotherapy, which is processed almost entirely by the liver, so you don't get the systemic side effects. The goal is to convert the cholangiocarcinoma to one that's able to be resected because that's the, the goal and the only curative treatment that we have. The hepatic artery infusion pump, there have been multiple trials specifically looking at cholangiocarcinoma in which almost 60% of patients had a radiographic response. In terms of treatment response for cholangiocarcinoma, that's really an amazing number of, of people who had a response to it. Almost 90% of patients were alive at one year, and there was a significant percentage of patients who were converted from those who were initially deemed unresectable to those that were then able to go on to a margin negative resection. There have been multiple other studies uh, in systemic reviews and meta-analysis that showed that patients with hepatic artery infusion pump with FUDR chemotherapy lived longer than those who just had chemotherapy alone. Other things that are offered at a multidisciplinary clinic, liver transplant. There are liver transplant protocols for both perihylar as well as intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Now, the criteria for these are a little bit different between the two. Here is the perihylar cholangiocarcinoma um, protocol for transplant. Basically, we'll look at the location of the tumor, the size of the tumor, the tumor marker, and if it's deemed unresectable uh, and it's above uh, what we call the cystic duct, um, then it would be an option for transplant. Um, those patients undergo a staging surgery where lymph nodes are removed to make sure that they are negative, followed by radiation and transplant. And this is also a very exciting kind of protocols that have uh, come out in the last decade and have really given a lot of um, hope and allowed our patients to really, with cholangiocarcinoma, to live long uh, in 
lives with a good quality of life. So I'm just going to um, talk a little bit again. I'm going to put this up here. As I said before, you know, these services, these options are all available at, you know, institutions who have multidisciplinary clinics. And it's been shown, you know, in multiple studies that patients specifically with liver cancer uh, and cholangiocarcinoma uh, live longer if, and have better outcomes if they're seen in a multidisciplinary clinic. Um, so we are going to open it up uh, for questions for anybody who has them. I'm going to stop sharing and Dr. Beretti can come back on. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free uh, to write them in the chat. And actually, let me just put this up. Okay, I do see one initial question about, um, the question is, why do men tend to have higher liver cancer rates than woman, women? So I think that um, those trends might be changing over time, but sometimes one of the difference in incidence is related to what are the underlying risk factors and um, some of the risk factors, including some form, you know, the hepatitis that we have discussed or the alcohol um, incidence might be more common in a male population. But as I mentioned, as we are seeing a change also in the most common risk factors, and we are seeing more and more fatty liver uh, related to either diabetes, obesity, um, those um, uh, the epidemiological trend of having more incidence in men over women might actually change. And honestly, that's what we are also seeing in our clinical practice now, nowadays. So the second question, uh, Dr. Beretti, um, at what consumption level does alcohol become a serious risk factor? Uh, so this is a great question. Um, th there are some um, recommendations from the CDC um, in which um, for women should be usually no more than one uh, glass a, a day and for men it might be even up to um, two. But my recommendation, it's very easily to overdo. And so there is, um, I think it's two drinks or less for a man and one drink or less for a woman um, should be the recommendation. Um, and and that, you know, daily recommendation, but I will see probably even weekly. Okay, great. So the third question, uh, should people who have liver cancer abstain for alcoholic, from alcoholic beverages? So um, I think we would all agree, uh, while there's no specific data that we would recommend uh, abstaining from alcoholic beverages, especially while undergoing treatment, uh, like systemic chemotherapy or targeted treatments. It's something you can certainly talk to your medical oncologist about. Um, and additional alcohol, even if your risk factor for hepatocellular cancer or cholangiocarcinoma, whichever one is not alcohol, um, excessive alcohol can uh, create additional injury in the of the liver which um, you know puts you at risk for additional cancers. So we would recommend abstaining from alcohol uh, during your cancer treatment. Um, the next question, what uh, is causing the drastic increase of liver cancer cases? Um, so in cholangiocarcinoma, uh, I think similarly to HCC and Dr. Beretti can also chime in, um, the increase in, obes in obesity, as well as type 2 diabetes and non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease uh, has significantly increased the risk of both hepatocellular as well as cholangiocarcinoma. Dr. Brady, do you have any comments? Yeah, so uh, I think that's very accurate. And this is, you know, tough conversations that we often have with patients and not always we do have, you know, a clear answer, but I think that... Um, the correlation between what we call the metabolic syndrome, so you know, fatty liver disease, diabetes, and obesity, and the 
increased risk um, associated uh, between these uh, conditions and liver cancers is the main reason why over these past few years we have seen this you know increasing incidence answers also in the western population so um i think that that um so kind of environmental uh, factors are to blame if you will okay it looks like the next question um are there specific races or ethnicities at higher risk for any of these cancers Yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, the data are not super uh, clear, but what we have seen is that an increase um, incidence of liver cancer, uh, especially both hepatocellular carcinoma, actually, I should say, and bile duct cancer in, uh, in some, you know, Asian population, again, mostly related to the risk factors, the exposure to specific toxins, such as the aflatoxin that Dr. Laparo was mentioning during our presentation, as well as increased incidence of some the hepatitis there. Um, we do have also a, a little higher incidence of liver cancer in the um, um, Afro-American and uh, you know black populations, which can be related also sometimes uh, from not having access to, for instance, hepatitis B vaccinations program. So I think that there is uh, increased uh, incidence in some uh, populations and races, which most of the time reflect the increased exposure to what are the known risk factors for these um, cancer types. Great. Um, um, the next question, uh, I've heard coffee is a protective agent against liver cancers. Is that true? So um, there have been some studies done and there is actually a meta-analysis that does show that two cups of coffee was, um, uh, you know, in the population of people they looked at who drank two cups of coffee versus none, there was um, a lower incidence of liver cancer. I think it's just important uh, to note uh, that, you know, it can affect other uh, diseases and you should, you know, consult with your physician um, before <laughs> drinking an increased amount of coffee. Um, Dr. Breddy, any comments on that one? No, I think that's very accurate. Um, I think everything in moderation, but yes, some uh, protective effect from caffeine on hepatocellular carcinoma have been shown and no clear uh, association with bile duct or cholangiocarcinoma. But of course, there are patients, you know, for other comorbidities that might not be, um, you know, doing very well with high dose of caffeine. So some moderation is always recommended. Um, next question, I think it's very um, interesting about the training for physicians. And yes, um, especially, and I will let Dr. Lafaro uh, talk, but for sure for surgery and in general, each uh, specialist um, uh, will have a special interest and training um, on liver cancer. This is true for the surgeon, of course, for you know the transplant team, but also um, at least in academic centers, medical oncologists, which is my specialty, we do really specialize in uh, tumor types because as you have seen, the treatment is so complex and so sometimes really require an expert that really you know, is focused on that um, type of disease um, specifically. I think the next question is mostly for you, um, the percentage of cases that are eligible for surgery, I guess both HCC and cholangiocarcinoma. So, you know, I'd say in cholangiocarcinoma, uh, unfortunately, at presentation, you know, about 20% or fewer are actually eligible uh, for resection. We do see um, a lot of um, kind of borderline resectable or unresectable cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, now, that's not to say that those patients never go on to surgery. We are able to convert, you know, quite a few number of patients with systemic and targeted therapy as well as local therapies you know to um, become resectable um, for hepatocellular carcinoma you know the answer is a little bit different because there are a lot of 
you know, some patients go on to transplant. And so pure resection um, is probably similar numbers, um, you know, to cholangiocarcinoma, but, you know, resection for a hepatocellular carcinoma is not always the, the goal. Um, and so that is, a, you know, a little bit different in that case. Um, so the next question, can a patient who is diagnosed as unresectable intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma um, and in the middle of the first chemotherapy immunotherapy cycle be a candidate for hepatic pump? So yes, 100%. Um, it's the pump can go in at any time, you know, after starting chemotherapy, the earlier, the better. Um but uh, what we really look at is a lot of your liver function to determine whether or not you'd be able to get um, a meaningful amount of chemotherapy through the pump. So we would look at the anatomy as well as your liver numbers uh, and the tumor itself to determine whether or not you're a candidate uh, for hepatic artery infusion pump. But certainly it can go in at, you know, at any time uh, after starting chemotherapy. So there's the question about uh, psilocybin on liver cancer, and I admit that I'm not aware of um, on studies um, around the effect of this um, on liver cancer, but I will be happy to look into this. And then, um, I don't know, Kali, if you have any experience. I don't. Um, I'm also happy to look into it. I Yeah. I um yeah so maybe we can spend a little more time to explain what is the hepatic artery infusion pump there is a lot of interest about that sure so the hepatic artery infusion pump is a it's a port it's very similar uh to the port that's placed for systemic chemotherapy but that uh, pore is placed under the skin of the left abdomen, and it's about the size of a hockey puck, so it's a little bit larger. There's tubing that goes specifically from the pump itself into the um, right up to the common hepatic artery, and so it allows chemotherapy to con to basically drip at a slow rate constantly through the hepatic artery into the liver. The chemotherapy used in the hepatic artery infusion pump is processed by the liver pretty much entirely so you don't get the systemic side effects. And we're able to give it in combination with systemic chemotherapy so you're able to get the benefit of both. Now, uh, these are filled every two weeks and it's not an infusion like your systemic chemotherapy, it's a direct injection, so it's a quick uh, fill. Um, and it is released, uh, as I said, slowly throughout yeah, that two-week period before it's refilled. Um, so it allows us to give a high dose of chemotherapy directly to the liver. Um, that was great. And then I can get this other question is about screenings or blood work to detect liver cancer. So you know, in terms of blood work, as you know, we were mentioning both for hepatocellular and bile duct cancer often is either you have risk factors and your physician takes, you know, blood work or you have symptoms, they are worrisome. So you can have alteration of liver function tests. Those can be um, worrisome, but per se are not, you know, enough to make any diagnosis. There are some tumor markers that we can measure in the blood um, as a blood work. The more specific for uh, liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma is alpha fetoprotein. The one that is more specific for cholangiocarcinoma is a CA99. All of these are in tests that can help and can be uh, adjunct in the diagnostic process, but per se, they are not enough to make a diagnosis. The screening is mostly, as I was mentioning right now, on uh, implement high risk with uh, either uh, ultrasound of the liver. In a specific case, we might obtain MRI of the liver as for um, as well. Um, so those are so it's a more a combination of imaging and blood work that together can give a sort of pretest probability of you know likelihood of have this type of cancer. 
There is, I do want to mention some work, including here, Johns Hopkins, of looking at more sophisticated and not invasive tools. So looking, for instance, a fragment of cancer uh, DNA or cancer cell in the bloodstream as a way to really detect super early on these tumor cancer types. We are doing really unprecedented progress. Some work has already been published and more work is ongoing. So that probably is going to be the future, but it's not the reality as of today. Next question is really for you, yeah. uh, the ALPS procedure. <laughs> yep. So the ALPS procedure is associated liver partition and portal vein ligation for a stage hepatectomy, which is really just a very long word uh, to say that, it, you know, that we do this uh, for tumors that are not resectable up front for those specifically that there's not enough liver uh, remaining. And so we will make the split in the liver and ligate the portal vein and go back about a week later after we've done a, a CT scan to ensure the liver has grown. So the liver is one of the two organs that regenerates. The skin is the other one. Um, and doing this procedure has shown that the liver will regenerate at a faster rate than if we just do something called a portal vein embolization, um, where we put glue into the portal vein to trick your body into believing that half of the liver is not there. So it regenerates while the liver's in place. This procedure is done more in the setting of colorectal liver metastasis, but is done in cholangiocarcinoma in certain situations. And it is something that we do offer here at Johns Hopkins. Um, all right, so the next one, uh, Marina, this is probably yes. a little bit more for you. So are there any new drugs to treat these cancers or any clinical trials where patients can get access to new experimental drugs at Hopkins? The short answer is yes. So, of course, we, as I think we mentioned both for Colangio and, and HCC, many progress in terms of approved and standard of care therapies, but there is a lot of more work to do. And so we really do an efforts um, to have clinical trials for every patient in every stage from the more early on to the more advanced stage either patients that are treatment naive, meaning they never got any treatment, or patients that already received the standard of care and eventually has stopped working or they do not tolerate. It's very hard, So the, meaning that we have different trials for different um, settings. So we are very um, uh, happy all the time to evaluate patients for a trial and discuss what could be the best option at each uh, time. Great. Thanks so much. The next question, uh, I, I'll take this one. If I have part of my liver where the tumor is removed, will the portion of my liver that regenerates have cancer also? So that's a, a great question. If the, the tumor is removed with negative margins, meaning that there was no cancer left behind, the liver that regenerates is actually normal liver. Um, so it's not going to be cancer cells that regenerate. Now, there is a chance, unfortunately, in both hepatocellular cancer and cholangiocarcinoma that it can recur in the liver or at the kind of edge of the margin of surgery. Um, and that's most likely to happen in the first two years if it's going to happen. Um, but the, you'll get surveillance after your surgery, uh, usually every you know three months just depending on your particular case um, where they will look at the rest of the liver and make sure that there's no evidence of any cancer there. Um, I think this was um, a very productive session. Actually, some of the questions were very important and they gave us the opportunity to cover things that we didn't have the time during the presentations. Um, I think, um, we can um, go ahead towards the conclusions. I just want to say how um, an important aspect of our team at Hopkins is really to have a patient-centered and focused type of care where we really want to improve the patient's journey through this type of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary where at the same time patients can have access to liver cancer experts from different specialties and try to really 
understand what is the best way to approach that specific patient case. As, a, as I mentioned before, one size does not fit all. So we really are happy to see any patients. Um, and here you can see our contact. Um, if you have any questions, if you would like to be seen in our clinic, either directly see one of the specialists or see everyone together in our liver MDC clinic. So you can see here the numbers and the emails um, and feel free to contact us.